Um, okay, so uh, welcome to everybody. Um, this is uh, the seminar from um, Memphis Mangler to Watch the Skies, A History of Meg Games by Alex Beck. And uh, I will be quiet now and hand over to Alex. Cool, thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, yeah, so welcome to my talk, everyone. Uh, as, as Chris said, from Memphis Mangler to Watch the Skies, A History of Mega Games uh, by me, Alex Beck. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'll, I'll start off uh, introducing myself. So I run Horizon Mega Games, which is a group in London. Uh, we put on sort of genre games, sci-fi and fantasy and things. Uh, I'm also a mega game designer, uh, but really more pertinent to the talk today is I have a, a real big history, uh, interest in the history of kind of like nerdy pop culture, um, especially kind of gaming, uh, both tabletop gaming and video gaming and, and everything in between really. I'm sort of fascinated by the way, something that was super niche in the 50s has become the biggest entertainment industry in the world. Um, so what am I going to cover tonight? Basically just the history of mega games uh, as, as best I can at a reasonably high level. Um, this project's still an early draft, um, so I won't have every little detail, I'm afraid. And it's, for example, it's pretty much a UK focus. Uh, I am going to look to expand it to cover the rest of the world, but for the moment I'll focus uh, on the UK because much of the history is here. Uh, and there, But even in the UK, there are a lot of people still to talk to. Um, and I guess just briefly wanted to touch on why uh, am I doing this, um, partly to amuse myself during the uh, pandemic, but um, mainly because it was not recorded. There's, there's various interviews uh, and a few blog posts and stuff. There's not really a single source for, for, for the, a lot of the history of mega games at this point. Um, I hopefully don't have to sell this to a mega game audience, but um, I think history is important. Uh, it, you know, it's an important part of, of the story of any kind of hobby or, or any part of pop culture. And how we got to today is an important part of that. Um, as a little aside, I think also there's some quite interesting parallels to other parts of gaming history. Uh, mega games have a uh, similar beginning as RPGs and, and other parts of gaming, and so I think it's a, it's, it makes an over, a really important thread of the overall history of gaming and one that's important to, uh, to detail and record. So that's what we're going to be doing. So first off, what I think is probably the most controversial slide in here. What is a mega game though? Uh, obviously uh, the guys just touched on this in the, in the uh, podcast chat, but um, I felt when I was setting out to do this, that it's important if you're recording the history of something, you need to define what that thing is. Uh, that way you can sort of say, this is the beginning of the thing. These are the things that should be included in your history and these things should not be. Um, so I've kind of at pretty high level and hopefully reasonably flexibly come up with a definition of, of what I think a mega game is. Um, it's probably not what everyone agrees with, but there you go. Uh, it's kind of what it was a working working definition for myself. So just really quickly, let's go through these just because I think it's important to define these things. Firstly, lots of players, 20 is a minimum, uh, it is my feeling. Um, an important one here, an important part of the history is to play as a single character. Now, it might be as limited as a job title, that might be a, a three page brief giving their personal history and, and everything. But it's important that I think you're playing as a single character, not as a, a military unit or as a nation or some of the other things you might do in other gaming types. Costumes and speaking character are optional, uh, which while they might not be in a LARP or in a role playing game, uh, in a mega game, they tend to be optional. However, taking game actions and character is essential. What I mean by that is uh, you should always be thinking, who is your character? What is their objectives? I will do those things, not necessarily what is, you know, uh, the best thing to do for winning the game. It's, it's about playing in character. Uh, some form of cooperation and communication for me is vital. Uh, people do not play these games alone. Uh, they play them in groups, play them in teams, and you work together and communicate and cooperate. Um, and my game is also played over multiple game elements. This could be lots of different things. This could be maps, teams, cards, so on and so forth. Um, but it's lots of elements interacting with each other. It's not just one team, one board, or just a single character sheet as in an RPG. Lots of different bits um, that all interact together. Um, theme and narrative is also embedded into the game for me. This, again, is an important part of the history, really. Um, it's You're not succeeding via uh, an abstract mechanic such as victory points you're, you're succeeding through the narrative it's you're, you're achieving objectives you're part of the story and you're exploring the story uh rules are flexible allowing for control decisions and what we like to call wizard wheezes and uh, this is not a board game with a set of rules that you have to follow um it's more like a role-playing game where things can be flexible and can change as the game is played and lastly the thing i don't, I don't think Gary gets talked about it much but i think it's actually quite important is the game space is entirely abstract now what kind of i mean by that 
is that a table might have a map of a spaceship on it. And if you're, if a player is standing at that table, they're on that spaceship, but that table is a table, not a spaceship. Um, and so for that real world position is not relevant to it. Unlike say in a lot where a forest is a forest or in a treasure hunt game, where you have to be in a very particular place in the real world to find the treasure. So the game space remains abstract. Okay. So we're now going to start actually talking about some history. We've defined kind of what, what a mega game is. And so we can start looking at what the history is. I'm not going to spend too long on this slide, but I just wanted to give uh, everyone kind of a bit of a flavor of the, the sort of size and the length of the history we're talking about here, uh, as well as some of the key games we're going to be talking about later on uh, today. Um, so we sort of start in the very early 80s with Memphis Mangler and also go through some recent years with Watch the Skies uh, and the things that followed that. Um, so we'll cover some of this a little bit more, but I just want to give you a flavor and you know, no doubt when you come back and watch this later, you can give it a bit more context. So we will start with the actual history itself now, the very earliest ancestors of mega gaming. Um, so I think it's important to sort of note that mega games have their roots in the sort of mid, mid 70s wargaming scene. Um, that in itself uh, has a number of ancestors and they all feed into it. So what was happening when mega games begin to come together? Um, and so it's I think it's really useful to have an understanding of some of those uh, at the initial level. Probably the most important thing, um, and one I would suggest that if you have any interest in game history, you go and read a bit about, is Kriegsville. Um, essentially what this was, was 19th century Prussian military gaming, war gaming. Uh, it was used for training by Russian, uh, Prussian generals, one of which you can see there with his, uh, with his amazing hat. But it defined a lot of concepts which really have, have found their way into a lot of modern gaming, uh, the way dice are used for, um, uh, to resolve things, uh, a lot of the way units move, a lot of, a lot of core gameplay mechanics were invented first in Kriegsville well over 100 years ago. So really important thing that fed all the way through to the 70s and through to today. More recently, as we enter the 20th century, uh, War gaming developed in other areas. There's sort of various, various military simulations run in the US by the Rand Corporation in the 50s and at various colleges around the country, sort of generally called crisis games. These kind of, in many ways, are pro mega games that are looking at a political or military situation and trying to resolve how, the, how they might turn out in the real world. On the more hobbyist side of things, uh, you have a couple of things here. The first one's the Avalon Hill cardboard chip war games. Um, any, any gamers who are listening about a certain vintage will be familiar with these. Uh, the paper hex maps uh, and then the little cardboard chits, no much more than a centimetre squared, each one representing an infantry division or a tank division or whatever it might be. Very popular in the 50s and 60s and, and, and onwards, uh, the military themed board games essentially, but a big part of the war gaming scene at the time. Uh, perhaps even more important with this, this sort of hobbyist miniatures war games. Um, this is a tradition started by H.G. Wells's Little Wars in the earliest 20th century. Uh, and as you know, familiar to many of us today as Warhammer and, and all those kind of things, the idea of moving little toy soldiers around a board, rolling dice to, uh, to resolve how they shoot each other or whatever. Really big part of uh, the 70s war games scene, uh, particularly kind of historical at the time, World War II, Napoleonic and other similar eras were, were played a lot. These are the same influences, I think. So it's an interesting aside here. Again, the parallels I was talking about earlier that Gary Gygax and Dave Arnson, you can see there uh, on the left, had in making d, &D. Um, They were very much part of the 70s wargaming scene. They happen to be in the American Midwest rather than South London, but um, very much the same starting point as mega, mega games. You see things evolve in a different way, but they, they had the same kind of ideas and reacting to the same scene. Anyone who's kind of interested in that, I'd, I'd strongly suggest going through Playing at the World by, by John Peterson that really explains a lot of these, uh, these um, early ancestors and also how, how they look to D&D. Fortunately, it doesn't cover Mega Games, but I can do that for you. <laughs> so moving on, uh, we get to the key figure in the very early days of Mega Games, uh, a man called Paddy Griffith, uh, who you can see there. Um, he was a, a military theorist and historian. Um, who in the sort of mid 70s was a lecturer at Sandhurst. Uh, for those perhaps not from the UK and don't know Sandhurst, it's the uh, sort of officer training academy school for the British Army. Um, and he was a lecturer there. And essentially as part of their training, he was running games. Uh, these, these were kind of war games, but in, in a professional way. So these were a large custom built facility, uh, had you know, it's maps, cellophane systems, multiple rooms. Uh, and as they were doing these as training for the cadets, um, this is 
obviously very much with the Cold War thing. These, these were guys in the late 70s who were yeah, potentially going to go fire the Russians in, in Germany. So that was the kind of game they were playing, if give games a set training simulation, shall we say. Um, they'd still been pretty much well run on the Kriegspiel model at this point, even though it's kind of 100 years old at that point. It was that kind of idea. The mechanics hadn't really moved on vastly at that point. Um, and these were, these were closed map games, Creeksville generally was. Um, just briefly want to talk about closed map because it might be a term people are not super familiar with. Um, what closed map is, um, is there is a, a true map, as in, in, in a modern mega game or in a board game. However, the only people who actually see that are the umpires of the control. They keep track of that, of exactly where the various you know, units, playing pieces, whatever, are on the map. Um, and all the players have a reports delivered via your umpires via control saying, you know, your unit has advanced this far into the town and met this amount of enemy resistance uh, or whatever it might be. And the players then keep track of what they believe the situation to be on their own map. Um, so hence closed map. The true map is closed off from the players. This is absolutely the, uh, the, the predominant model at the time um, and, and would be for, for many mega games still occasionally played these days, but, but much, much less common. So by to about 1978, uh, Paddy is now running games for about 30 people, all as part of this uh, sort of professional training for the, for the cadets. These in many ways were pro mega games to 30 people. It's uh, lots of elements playing against each other, but they were a pure war game focus of a professional for their training uh, and probably lacked some of the key elements that uh, I called out in the last slide. Um, however, Paddy really had an interest in, that, in, in new ideas too. Uh, he was interested in kind of theatrical elements, making it more fun and just experimenting with games and what they could be. Um, and while that obviously wasn't possible necessarily as part of the cadet training, um, he also ran the Sandhurst War Games Club, which was more a hobbyist for the cadets in their, in their free time rather than part of their training and where more experiments could happen and ideas could really be played out, had more of that theatre and more of that experimentation. However, it wasn't just about Paddy. There were also what, what I'm calling the plucky young, young iconoclasts, which I'm sure they'll love. Um, so um, most primar my primarily for our story is Chestnut Lodge War Game Group, uh, formed in the mid-70s uh, by Jim Warman, Brian Cameron, Andy Granger and Terry Martin. Uh, for those who don't know them, there is a younger Jim there on the bottom. Uh, that's unfortunately not from the mid 70s that's probably actually a late 80s maybe an early 90s photo but a younger Jim uh, and then we have a more recent photo uh, on the left uh, Terry there is in the middle in the light blue shirt and Brian at the top on the right of that photo I didn't can find a photo of Andy from recently but um, that gives you an idea of, of the main uh, characters in our story so yeah, in the mid seventies, Chestnut Lodge was formed. Initially, initially kind of like a hobbyist war game group, just to play war games, like any other group. But Jim uh, made contact with Paddy, uh, and from there, Chestnut Lodge began to take on more of an experimental feel, kind of learning and uh, being influenced by what Paddy was up to in Sandhurst. This kind of also led to the, uh, to the formation of the War Game Developers Group. Uh, this was formed by Paddy, Jim and, and several others. And this is more of an umbrella group for, for ideas. So what Chestnut Lodge was doing, what was happening at Sandhurst uh, and elsewhere, kind of where some of these experiments can be talked about and, and things can be moved beyond the sort of classic War Game model. For those interested, both are still around. Chestnut Lodge is uh, it's absolutely still key in the development of Mega Game Makers games. Uh, anyone who's played one of their games, that's almost certainly been, been developed as part of uh, what Chestnut Lodge do. Um, and so really they're still focused on, on Mega Games, though they're not exclusively. Um, War Game Developments Group is also around, um, though they hadn't a War Game focus really for, for a very long time and have not really been involved in, in Mega Games, but they are still very much about. So we now get to our origin event. Uh, I'm afraid it wasn't radioactive spiders or gamma rays or anything too exciting like that, um, but mega games do have an origin event. Um, and this is the New Directions in Wargaming Conference. So uh, held at Moor Park in Farnham, which is a, a little town a bit outside London, not too far from where I live. Uh, it was run over one weekend in May, 1980. Uh, 50 odd people attended, uh, including many from Chestnut Lodge itself, as well as Paddy and Sandhurst and, and elsewhere. So the sort of point of this um, conference is really to focus on all these new ideas and experiments that have been floating around in the, in the last sort of two or three years um, across the various gaming groups, the ones we've talked about and, and the wider community, 
and was aimed at kind of solidifying these ideas and themes that they were talking about and seeing how they could be sort of pushed forward into, into actually more practical games. And so from that, I think it's really just, you know, sort of talked a bit about experiment and new ideas and stuff. So what were they talking about here at this conference at the, uh, uh, at this origin event of mega games? Uh, how, how did we get from, you know, the miniatures war games and the Krieg spiel to, to a modern mega game? Is there so uh, lovely demonstrated by uh, Mirror Shades, one of my end games. Um, and so there were a couple of, sort of key things that were, that were sort of added to the war game template. Role playing, perhaps one of the more important ones. Um, the idea that you'd be playing as a character, not as a military unit or um, a sort of just a, a faceless military officer. The idea is you had, you had a character with objectives and views and a position on politics and those kind of ideas. In addition to that, the other really important part was the addition of politics. You wanted to tell the whole story. It wasn't just who fought this battle and who won, but why were they fighting? What happened once the battle was over? What was, what was the political situation around it and about? So it's telling the whole story, not just telling a fraction of the story. This whole idea was really to move away from this kind of dry war gaming, uh, you know, playing with more than toy shots or toy soldiers um, and, and just simple military situation and simulation. It was to have more, to have more theatre, more fun, more ideas in it. Um, and, and that absolutely led to the theatrical elements as well. Kind of, I guess, it's something we, we often play with in, in modern mega games. You know, what props could be used? How can the event space be used to do something different? What costumes can be put into this? You know, all ideas that you know you're not going to get in a, in a professional military simulation, but it's something that can be really fun in a more hobbyist mega game scenario. One thing that I don't think we do at all really today uh, is, is actually there was a certain amount of looking at taboo subjects as well. What, what were the limits of game? Um, you know, this was the early 1980s, for example. So could you do a game based on the Troubles in Ireland or, or was that something that was, that was not acceptable uh, for, for whatever reason? You know, what other darker subjects could be looked at? Um, and I think that's, in, that's interesting in itself because it shows that, that you know, these group of people, they were looking to push boundaries everywhere. It wasn't just changing mechanics and, and pushing the boundaries of what war gaming or gaming men, but it was, you know, it was the whole concepts of, of, of everything, pushing the whole boundaries of the, the concept as far as they possibly could be. So these are the kind of the ideas that were being discussed at the conference uh, that come out of Sandus, that come out of Chestnut Lodge. So this finally leads us about halfway through the presentation to our first mega game. So Memphis Mangler, which was designed by Paddy. Uh, it was ran the 17th of March, 1981, uh, which was 40 years ago this week. Uh, so it's the 40th birthday of mega games this week. So, you know, happy birthday, mega games. That was, uh, that pleased me when I, when I noted that when I was putting this presentation together, a little bit uh, nice for us. Uh, the game itself was held at Sandhurst. Uh, uh, Woolwich Hall, about 30 people were involved, similar numbers as to the sort of professional games Paddy had been putting on. Uh, the sort of theme was uh, Vietnam War, uh, sort of battalion sweep operation. Uh, the idea was that, you know, battalion of uh, American soldiers landed in an area of South Vietnam and, uh, and then hunt for uh, you know, VC and MVA. Um, the game, in fact, was technically called Memphis Mangler 4, um, not because it was the fourth game in a series, but because it was kind of it summed up the sort of operation names the Americans used in that war. You know, it was always, you had linebacker one, linebacker two, linebacker three, and so on. Um, what kind of differentiated the game, though, uh, not so much the theme and, and the ideas, was that it added extra elements to what to, to the classic war game. It added the politics in it. It added a certain amount of roles and role playing. There was a, a village game uh, whereby people played the South Vietnamese villages and how they reacted to, to the battle and everything was happening around it. So, you know, the, it, it's hard, it was the classic war game still, but there were these new ideas being, being put in. Uh, and then most famously, and why we think probably consider it the first mega game, was that Andy Callan famously said, it's not just a game, it's a mega game. Uh, everyone swears that happens and it's not a pop full legend, so we'll, we'll go with that fact. <laughs> um, however, I think it's really important to note here that it, it didn't seem wildly different at the time to the players. It was just another game in a series of games that were slowly evolving over time. Uh, and probably it was only in a certain amount in retrospect that it got given a certain level of importance. But, you know, for the sake of history, it's our first game and it's 40 years ago, so that's exciting. So we do now sort of into the fully into the 80s and mega games absolutely start becoming a thing. Uh, some photos here showing it as a thing. Most of these are from the very late 80s, possibly even slipping into the early 90s. Unfortunately, the early days are not super well documented. 
uh, but uh, I think they give you an idea. Um, it was still slow, slow development at this point. There was about one game a year. Um, so, I mean, I think it was no more than 10 throughout the decade. Um, you know, we, in a busy month, we might have 10, 10 games worldwide now, but it took them a decade to get through that. But development was happening. Um, it was slow with only one game a year, but active. There was lots of new ideas flying around, a lot of experimentation, um, and very much making games were starting to be formed as a, as a single thing. Um, Paddy, also Jim Orman and Eddie Granger were the primary designers in this period, um, putting the games together. Uh, initially, certainly for the first sort of five or six years, pretty much all the games were military themed and closed map, very much an extension of, of Memphis Mangler uh, and the other war games that happened before that. However, they didn't stay like that. Uh, Becky earlier was talking about how much she liked pirate games and rums, uh, and rum, and uh, absolutely that uh, is a tradition <laughs> that starts in some of the earliest days uh, of mega games with Blood and Thunder in 1987. This was Jim's first game. Um, it was based on a pirate RPG he'd, be, he'd been running at the time um, and basically thought, well, the ship's officers on a pirate ship are not so dissimilar to the officers in a military command, uh, which was, would have been used in all the previous mega games, so that it was a sort of format that could, uh, could easily transfer across. So you can see the photo there of the game in action uh, involved lots of little model ships that had been sourced from various places that would uh, you know, sail around the, uh, the pirate isles and sort of go into battles and uh, all sort of usual pirate hijinks. Um, also, I think you can see in the photo there, we've got costumes uh, are very much in play by this point. Uh, the chap there in the uh, pirate hat and costume in the middle there. So, you know, already these themes that are, that are common in Modern games are absolutely in place there. Um, now, one thing that I think we don't have enough in modern games, but absolutely need to bring in, is the idea of a pirate feast. So this is a full, full feast with suckling pig and, and other delicacies, um, and then an awful, awful lot of rum if the stories are, are true, uh, which I'm sure they are. Many slightly tipsy mega gamers, and uh, more than a few recollections are a little bit hazy. Um, so yeah, very much the pirate theme uh, has been common from the start, and usually involved alcohol. Also in the 80s, um, right at the end, we get the first sci-fi game, also by Jim in 1989. Uh, also it's the first game to use a known intellectual property um, based on Star Trek, as you possibly guessed from the uh, photos there. Um, this is the original series era, so Kirk and Spock and co. Uh, mainly because Next Gen with Picard wouldn't uh, reach the UK until 1990. Uh, which sadly was three years after the US. Uh, I won't tell you how terrible it was to be a nerd in the UK in the 80s and 90s, but we were, we were not well treated. But anyway, the game um, was the first really big game with 173 players, which even you know today would be a, a really big game. That's, you know, so it's shown that they had a lot of players uh, really filling these games out. As you can probably see from the photos, it's kind of based on a lot of starship battles, Klingons versus the Federation and so on as well as other kind of classic starship tropes. But um, again, there was experimentation and ideas and different things going into this. Uh, it wasn't just a, a dry battle. There was some physical mechanics, such as, you know, when you had to put on a space suit, you actually physically put on a motorcycle helmet and gloves uh, and had to play the game dressed up in your space suit. So, you know, again, you, you know, few years now since the first game, but really getting into different stuff where we've got sci-fi, we've got intellectual property, you know, we've got these kind of crazy physical mechanics in there as well. We're going to take a slight detour now uh, into Oxford. So um, around about 1980, uh, 1990, sorry, uh, a chap called Marcus Watney sort of played a few games and decided he had a, a design. Um, and he also thought it was perfect. Uh, and though others in the group offered him feedback and, and wanted to help him develop it, perhaps into a better game, he kind of refused uh, and said, yeah, he wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna take any feedback on board. He was just gonna run it as is. So he went solo, he, he was based in Oxford uh, and, and ran the game there. Um, as a game, it doesn't really have much to say in the history. It's, you know, it, it was basically a board game, just run like a mega game, nothing overly special. Uh, one interesting element was that to join, you didn't buy a ticket or whatever, you just bought the components for your team. So essentially all the bits that you needed to, to run a team, you bought as if you were buying a, a board game or something off the shelf. Uh, and then whenever you wanted to play, you turned up with the team and your components you already bought. Uh, it, it ran it a few times um, and then vanished. 
Uh, unfortunately, couldn't track down any photos of this, so there's an artist's rendering of what the, they may or may not have actually looked like. But they're gone and irrelevant to history, apart from one really important thing that this caused. It caused our young iconoclasts from earlier to become the high priests of mega gaming at this point. So essentially, in, in response to this Oxford group forming and, and setting up, um, the original core group uh, decided that they kind of maybe needed to have more of a formal identity, give themselves a degree of control, a bit of brand management, if you want to call it that, uh, and, and more importantly, probably a bit of quality control over the game. So if you went to mega game, you kind of knew what you were going to get. So this led to the formation of Mega Game Makers. Uh, again, it was Jim Bryan and Ian Terry who formed it. Uh, initially, there obviously others were involved. Um, and um, around about 1990, the first game is put on. Their first game was Springtime for Hitler. You can see some of the photos of it in action there. Um, it's credited as being designed by the four founders, as well as Graham Atfield and Peter Howland. Um, so six designers on a single game quite possibly the most designers ever. I certainly can't think of a game that's got six, uh, six other people designed it. Um, but again, big, 167 players, um, and really showed that, you know, at this point, Mega Game Makers have a really big audience. Uh, the theme itself was perhaps uh, less interesting, sort of, you know, traditional closed map, military, World War II, check how these themes that, you know, uh, were still really popular, even though things had moved into other areas as well, always these, these kind of classic war game themes would always bring people out and always be popular with the crowd. So we now move into the 90s proper. Uh, lots more games is really the themes that seem of the 90s. Absolute explosion following the formation of Mega Game Makers. Uh, up to about a dozen during 1993, I think it's kind of a high point, but regularly many more games than, than we've seen in the 80s. Games were also getting a lot of plays. Uh, regularly 80 or 90 was kind of standard, sometimes going up much higher as needed if, if the game design was appropriate and the theme kind of attracted people. But most games were still kind of closed map and military. That was still the, the, the most common, uh, mainly because World War II in particular was just popular with players. There were lots of tank heads who wanted to play those games, so put those games on to, 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 to get the crowds, keep the people happy. Um, but absolutely there was a variety of mechanics and themes in use as well you know i think it's really important to, to highlight you know it wasn't just war games uh, there was a lot else going on besides for example one new mechanic uh, which i think is now really standard in the uh, in pretty much every mega game you have was the addition of the media uh, at unfinished business by terry martin in 92 uh, he added that in and that's obviously become a really standard mechanic and a key part of the game experience i think for many people also in the 90s, uh, Chestnut Lodge becomes the kind of main development hub for games. Um, it, as, as mentioned previously, you know, it becomes the sort of feeder and development hub for making game makers. So games tend to go through Chestnut Lodge, a few iterations, a bit of feedback, a bit of improvement, and then the game gets put on. Around about a dozen designers actively working, a few others that come and go, but about sort of a dozen real core designers at this point. However, by the end of the decade, player counts are beginning to drop, beginning to dwindle a little. Um, so it's sort of around 50-ish. Um, generally speaking, the player group's getting older, had other responsibilities, moved away from the sort of free time you might have for playing a lot of, a lot of, a lot of games. However, I think it's probably worth uh, noting that it does actually mirror a lull in tabletop gaming in general in the, in the late 90s. Board games particularly vanished to pretty much nothing. RPGs really struggled, uh, you know, aside from really uh, Magic the Gathering, the whole tabletop industry was in a real tough place. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't anything unique to mega games at that point. So we move into the noise. Um, a new themes and mechanics start to become more commonplace at this point. Um, and, and it moves even further away from the kind of classic closed map war game. Uh, there's a few games here, there's many I could have talked about, but I've sort of to pull out a few that I just feel sort of illuminate some interesting things. First of all, I want to look at sort of 2002. There's two games, again, both by Jim, that kind of I think show the, the fact that there's still some of the older sort of style games going on, and also some newer, some more modern style games. So you had Prosperity Station which is a sci-fi game with hundreds of minis uh, sort of, you know, in, on a space station in much more of the kind of classic war game style of uh, miniatures war game, if you're lots of moving around a map and, and shooting each other and whatnot. However, in the same year, Jim's also developing Crisis in Britannia, a game that's run in the last couple of years again in this country is very much more of a modern style game um, with, you know, kind of politics, role-playing, 
in this case, it's about the Roman invasion of Britain, but uh, a lot of the ideas, the themes and the structure of it would be very much what you'd see in a, in a game playing up to date today. Moving forward a bit, uh, we get right angles to reality in 2006. There's a couple of photos from the game there. This is a Cthulhu role-playing game, essentially, not so far from Call of Cthulhu or something, or one of the many other Cthulhu role-playing games out there, um, designed by Brian, Jim, and uh, Richard Hans as well. And, and I think this just kind of shows how much we've moved beyond the wargaming. You know, this is, this is nothing like the games that Paddy was putting on now. These are not military simulations. These are not war games. This is into a, into a whole other realm. Similarly, in 2007, we get Andrew Hadley's first game, uh, For the Light of the Trees, which um, is based on Tolkien's Silmarillion, uh, the prequel to Lord of the Rings, essentially a sort of uh, somewhat impenetrable uh, legends that, that lead up to, to Lord of the Rings. A couple of really interesting mechanics here that are kind of fascinate me, certainly. Uh, the book takes uh, its story that spans kind of centuries, uh, millennia really. And so to kind of get some of that sort of idea of a great age into the game, that each turn is 25 years long, um, which is, you know, really interesting and different to where we normally might have a month or a day as a turn. Uh, and had the interesting effect that if you're playing a human character, you only are alive for two turns and then you die of old age. Uh, obviously, the player comes back, respawned as, you know, as, as another character, but um, you know, there's this constant turnover of human players, while the elven players, who, who live you know, essentially immortal lives, obviously stay the same the whole way through, which is something that's a really interesting way to get, kind of get that theme into the game. Um, similarly, another really interesting part of, sort of Tolkien's themes is, is, the, you know, is the vastness of, of Middle-earth, the sort of exploration, the travels, the journeys, and to kind of represent that, they have 40 map tables, which again, I, I don't think you see very often in <laughs> very many mega games, I don't know, that's just great, where you can sort of have so many map tables and, and move amongst them. So one thing that's going on sort of during uh, this whole kind of period through the noughties, uh, as I say, lots of different themes, mechanics, a little bit of part of this is being driven by the board game, board game renaissance, which is happening at the same time. Lots of new mechanics are coming out of the Euro games and then some of the earlier American games that have been developed at that point uh, and, and sort of giving designers ideas and starting points to, that can feed into mega games. But things are not all well in the world of mega games. Uh, player counts are really continuing to drop at this point. Um, by the end of the decade, probably down to about 30 is the average for the game. Uh, there's a few photos there from games at the, uh, the end of the decade, and you can kind of uh, see fairly sparsely populated. And there were very real concerns that uh, mega games could actually die off at this point. The form would be, would, would, would essentially finish within a few years. Uh, and really, I think about lowest ebb was kind of, uh, it was kind of at, Things were lowest point when Jim presented a game called Watch the Skies, which some of you may have heard of. And we will come back to that in a minute, but there's just one other point in the, uh, the noughties I wanted to cover. The two-day game, the only two-day game I think I'm aware of, certainly in this period, uh, it was the hundredth mega game. Uh, and it was decided that a sort of suitable celebration to mark that, uh, that occasion was needed. Um, and a two-day two game was suggested. So Jim hurriedly designed one, uh, it was called the Last War, essentially a global reenactment, re if you will, of, of World War II, with all kind of key, key elements included. Um, as you can see some of the detail on the map there. There was an awful lot going on. Uh, ran October 2005, about 120 players. So while in general the player counts had, uh, had dropped off uh, during this period, as this sort of big event, particularly one that was World War II themed, that was, that was always popular, a lot of the old guard, a lot of the old players came back again. Another interesting element of this is run on a boat in the Thames. Um, it's a really unique location. Uh, I think it's kind of quite fun. Um, you know, and definitely a suitable celebration for, for the 100th game. Um, reports say it wasn't smooth, but, but not a disaster either. Um, and, and I'm certainly kind of, I kind of quite like the idea of having a two day game and, and running it again, an experiment that maybe we should uh, retry at some point. So finally, we get to that game with aliens. Crazy idea. Um, Many of you are probably more than familiar with what Watch the, Sky, Watch the Skies is, but uh, it was run 17th of May 2014, obviously designed by Jim Warman as well. Uh, and I think for me, it's kind of like the Mega Games version of uh, the Sex Pistols at the Free Trade Hall. If anyone knows their, their pop music history, uh, this is a gig with kind of 30 people, uh, but it changed, changed the face of British music as, as most of these people went and formed incredibly influential bands. Uh, and and Watch the Skies the same, 30 people, but it changed the face of mega games. Uh, in this case, because four of them were from Sharp and Sit Down. 
I guess most people know who Shut Up and Sit Down are, but just in case anyone doesn't, they are very popular uh, and influential board game reviewers on the internet. Um, <laughs> they were invited to the game by Ben Moore, so you can see down uh, in the bottom right there. Um, he's a big board game fan and thought that, they, that, that Shut Up and Sit Down might get something out of seeing a mega game in action. Uh, Jim, however, was, was terrified. <laughs> he, he felt the game was somewhat cobbled together, uh, at that point, they barely had the player count to get the games going um, and was really concerned that, you know, some bad coverage from someone like this could really just like, end to make games once and for all. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a tense day. However, as I'm, we all know, uh, it, it did not go badly and went incredibly well. Uh, Pop Pro is making games in a way that just, you know, probably wasn't expected by anyone. Uh, in the last few years, we've had thousands of new players, dozens of designers, dozens of games, uh, and, you know, there's no doubt about mega games in there, bigger than they've probably ever been. So what happened next? Uh, lots. Uh, and my talk was officially meant to end at Watch the Skies, so I'll only cover this very quickly. Uh, but obviously, Watch the Skies T3 and 4 happened next, uh, over the next couple of years. There were hundreds of players, huge games. Uh, Watch the Skies 2 was my, my first game, as, and I'm sure many of these were also other people's first mega games. Uh, really unique experiences, and probably the, the biggest game still to date to be run. Following those, a whole bunch of other UK games have been to form. Uh, Pen Iron, Southwest, My Own Horizon, Reading, True North, uh, and others all formed around the country in the next few years. Obviously, games start and, and groups start forming all around the world as well. It becomes no longer just a UK thing. Mega games really are everywhere. After the Watch the Skies and this, we then probably get the next really big, interesting experiment with Urban Nightmare, State of Chaos in the summer of 2017. <clears throat> the first and still only wide area mega game where about a dozen groups come together, play the same game at the same time, on the same day, with the games interacting between each other. Um, I've talked about it before, but for me, it was still probably one of the most amazing and unique gaming experiences I've ever had. Again, another experiment that maybe, maybe needs to be looked at to be tried again. And lastly, and I probably don't need to tell anyone this, obviously we've had a pandemic uh, and the move to online. Um, people were experimenting with online mega games beforehand, but it's, it's absolutely become the norm in the last 12 months. Uh, and whilst I think there's still challenges to that form to overcome, uh, it's, it, I don't see the formats that you know, it's not going to vanish. It's, it's definitely part of mega games going forward. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that in itself will become marked as a really important part of the history of mega games going forward. So that's it. My well, history ends there, more or less. Um, how this is just a taster. Um, tried to fit in as, as, as much as I could uh, in the shortest time as, as I had. Could probably talk to two hours, at least if my voice had, <laughs> could keep going. I lost so many games to cover and talk about. Yeah, there's still lots more to do in this history, as I touched on at the start. Um, there's lots of people from the UK, certainly from the early days and more recent. I've not had a chance to speak to you other than the most brief chats at, at various times. Um, and there's a lot in the US prior to Watch the Skies 2. Um, there, it's a parallel evolution. It's not, um, there's no real direct links to mega games, but I'm sure things like the Braunsteins, the NSDM games, uh, and other things probably now influence mega game design. So uh, have become part of the mega game history and probably need to be looked at. And then obviously games and designers around the world since Watch the Skies, there's obviously a huge and active scene all over Europe, Australia, America. And I mean, I think probably there's been games everywhere every continent but probably antarctica so you know lots of people to talk to about the last few years um so that's done for the sort of there's some thanks and sources a few people i've spoken to recently at length they were really helpful putting this together uh various podcasts and panels that were really good sources um and a few books there that are obviously not really about mega games but uh have really provided some really interesting context um uh, and background to the sort of wider gaming history um, and if anyone wants to sort of talk about any of these stuff, I could probably bore you with ages of podcasts and websites that I've used. So that's the uh, end of my talking. Uh, and we'll go to questions. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I, yeah, you, you said it would be 40 minutes and you're practically bang on the dot. I'm very impressed. Well done. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say my first mega game was Watch the Skies 4 because obviously I'm one of the sort of, I'm not young, but I'm your age, but um, one of the newer generation that came to mega games after Watch the Skies, after Man Watch the Skies. And, and yeah, that was really interesting. I didn't know half of that stuff or more than half of that stuff. So thank you very much. Yeah, That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Um, based on all your research and obviously what you plan to do in the future, uh, Mr. Mega Game himself has asked a question. Uh, will you be writing a book about this? 
Um, I don't know is simple answer. I started this with no um, no end goal inside of how I was going to present this. It was it was just something to do during lockdown, um, and then this came up. I thought, great, this is a great way to to do it. So I may expand it for future cons and add more detail. Maybe I'll look to do something more long form blogs or uh, or a book or something. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that just yet. But I, I'll probably do something with it. Definitely. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I would read it. It was really good. Well done. And um, we've got a question here from Alex Casper. Uh, he says, the element of human players dying off in the Middle Earth game is really interesting. Are there any particularly interesting mechanics you came across in your research that challenge players to play the characters in novel ways? Because obviously it's always a, a challenge, isn't it, as a mid-game designer to try and get, get players to play their characters in you know, the way you want them to play them. Yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely think that one from Andrew's game was was definitely one of the more interesting ones because uh, I think how we deal with death in mega games is um, is often a bit a controversial and difficult topic. You know, people don't necessarily want to die. You know, it can often be a you know an upsetting or annoying experience. So I think having that written into the game is interesting. Um, the other one, which is from a slightly more recent game, so some people might be more familiar with it, is. Um, I think it's called of Gods of Men and Men, Gods and Men, uh, the Greek game. Um, that was uh, run by, designed by Paul and Bruce, I think. Uh, and the mechanic there that I found was fascinating was where uh, the gods were played by three people. Uh, this to emulate the kind of capricious uh, and almost random nature of the Greek gods. This, this is a Greek god saying. So Ares would be played by three people. You talk to one of them and get one response, talk to another and get a completely different viewpoint. So I thought that was, that was really fascinating. So there, there were two, definitely. things like i've lost chris oh, i've muted myself look at that <laughs> total professional alex you know i am um you, <laughs> you mentioned the final frontier game that had 173 players mm. i mean obviously that was back in what the 90s i think uh 89 was the first one i think there were two, two or three sequels for it because yeah. obviously yeah. The, the the biggest game that i've known that jim has run was the 300 person watch skies games but uh do you think that um there'll be any more big games in the future yeah, I think so. I'm sure there will be. Um, I think it, it does have some interesting design challenges. Um, you know, I think how you make sure those players have fun roles to do, um, how there's enough to keep them going, how the, the interactions can be controllable. So, so I think it's, it's more of a challenge, challenging design element, but um, I think the community is there to do it, definitely. I think it has the right theme, the right promotion. Certainly, it's only in the UK. I'm sure you'd, you'd have no trouble doing it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot of people and a lot of groups in the UK now. We're very blessed, I think. In normal times, there are, I, I, you go to a make game probably every other weekend, if not more, which is very cool. Um, for the two-day make game, obviously the one based on the ship that you mentioned, do you think, um, Mr. Make Game asked, do you consider any of the online games, um, that maybe like Jim's We Made It, um, to be considered to be more of a legacy mega game? Yeah, I think it's probably something different from... Um those kind of legacy games where um, it's over several you know, several weeks um, or the Urban Nightmare that we did back before the pandemic where we played one session in London and then sort of two months later played a sort of follow-up session. I think the sort of gap and also possibly shifting players is probably a bit different to cramming it into one weekend. I don't know if it's necessarily a different design challenge. It probably isn't, but I think it's a different player experience, certainly, where you, you know, you've played it all day, you go to bed and you start playing again. I think that's different to having a week camp. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to play it, but I, I don't know. I, I played um, a couple of games at um, Gen Con a couple of years ago in 2019 when when Matt went, we went to went to America, and uh, I was wiped out. So I'm not sure I'd want to play. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I tend, tend to have a mega game hangover personally the next day after me. I love yeah. them, but uh, yeah, they're, they're full on experiences for sure. Definitely. I got a question here. How cop um, How would you deal? Or how do you think people should deal with copyrighted franchises? Um, Obviously, if you're designing something like, I mean, Den Wolves obviously has sort of the file number scratched off for, for, um, for Battlestar Galactica. How, how would people, how should people deal with that? So, I mean, I think I've ranted about this in public a few times. So, uh, just for background, my uh, my day job is, is is about music copyright. So, uh, I have my eggs very much in the sort of pro copyright and defending copyright basket. Um, so, you know, I'd always say, you know, if you want to use do copyright something based on copyright on an existing IP, you should really try and get permission for it. Um, realistically, that's probably not going to be, if you want to do a Star Wars game, it's going to probably be difficult to get Disney to give you permission uh, to do that. So you probably are better off doing like with Den of Wolves and other games where you, you take all the influence, you know, you steal everything you want, but just take out the copyright names, you know, take out the fact it's not about, you know, it's not about Star Galactica, it's Den of Wolves. 
but they're not Cylons, they're Wolves. You can have exactly the same gaming experience, just as fun, but you know, you're not, you're not stealing someone's copyright. So, so that's that's what I would say. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I got a question here from Tom Mendelson. Um, do you think the same level of innovation exists in the current scene as it did in the 80s and 90s? And do you think um, the form can continue to evolve, as in make games kind of continue to, to change and become better? Yeah, I think they're, they're in different places. And, and I think it, I touched on it a bit in, in the, the slides, but it's because mega games are always going to be parallel to other forms of tabletop gaming. I think it depends on how other tabletop gaming is evolving. So mega games starts off in the early 70s in the same place as role playing did, and they kind of evolve in parallel. Uh, and no doubt there was some influence from role playing games uh, into it, to mega games and other forms of gaming. And, and I think, again, Maybe in the 90s, there was slightly less of that, but then you get the, the, the sort of board game renaissance in the noughties, and a lot of those ideas begin to filter into mega games. And I think, again, we're, we're a particularly rich time for tabletop games. Uh, I mean, you know, board games, role playing games uh, are just huge, bigger than they've probably been for, forever. Uh, and, and so that means there's a lot of ideas, a lot of new mechanics. And so these are always things that the designers can use to, to take inference from or just frankly straight out steal. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, thought, I think there's definitely plenty of room still for, for innovation. Uh, whether it's as innovative as when you're inventing a form, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, certainly there's plenty of room for innovation. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, we've got a question here from me, but I think there's possibly either Matt or Becky, somebody who's logged in my account because we've obviously organised this over Zoom. <laughs> sure. So uh, w which of the pre watch the Guys games, because obviously you gave us a list there, quite a, quite a few that the, um, the pre watch the Guys sort of uh, mega makers and other, other folks designed, which of them would you most like to play? I, am, I actually am really interested in, I, I love Star Trek, uh, it's one of my favourite kind of sci-fi, so I would have loved to have played my Final Frontier games, um, you know, I think, I think that I'd, I'd really like to have played those, uh, yeah, some big Star Trek battle games, would have been great. Yeah, honestly, seeing the pictures of the giant yeah, um, spaceships yeah. is incredible. No, really, really, yeah, kind of, yeah, Jim should get that out of storage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's got them in a, in a loft somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and from you personally your personal bit of history uh, Alex what was your obviously I, I for personally I played my first game was Watch the Skies 4 that Jim ran in 2016 um, and obviously I got hooked from that point onwards but what was your first per, um, game that you played so it was it was Watch the Skies 2 yeah so um, it, was, it was yeah pretty much straight after the Watch the Skies video and sort of seen that and um, I think there were a couple of other mega game makers games but they all they all sold out yeah pretty much instantly so um, yeah it was the first of the big Watch the Skies for me which was um, yeah it was a weird experience um, I'm not sure it was an entirely enjoyable one <laughs> I'll be honest uh, if it was more the, the what the uh, you know the ideas behind it and the promise of the form I think rather than the actual kind of role I had on the day that was really helpful so I've, I've said this before I was on a team with uh, Tim Campbell and other people and I think the people I happened to be with were some more experienced and really helped me enjoy the game so yeah it was, it was great what uh, team were you on and what was your role it was China uh, which was a really good team and I think it's always a really interesting team I watched guys I was one of the one of two scientists and I think the science game I watched guys too is probably a little um, uh, it kind of the science control were really uh, overworked and it, did, it was quite difficult to kind of do a huge amount with it but um, yeah so the role wasn't great the team was amazing and yeah it was it was good enough for me to come back so. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, I think Mr. May Games asking who in the QA who I was in Watch the Skies 4. Um, unless he's asking you possibly. Did you play Watch the Skies 4, Alex? Um, I did. I was uh, a whale in Watch the Skies 4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <yeah>. good. <laughs> Excellent. And what was your what was your role? What was your um, objective or objectives in, in Watch the Skies 4 then? Um, so the whales and the dolphins, what was we were basically just I think, sort of keep peace and sort of like we were kind of much more advanced than humans and just kind of make sure the earth wasn't going to get fucked up um but then there was also the deep ones and stuff it was a bit a bit hazy exactly what happened it was a crazy crazy game so um, <laughs> fair enough yeah 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 it was crazy um i was part of the angolan team if matt is asking me what my role was i was an ambassador on the angolan team and i actually ended up changing towards a scientific role and um, try and get us some more science and get us some boosted up the uh, world rankings a bit but uh like you mentioned, a bit of a crazy game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You you said in your, your presentation, Alex, that there was a founding conference for mega games, obviously that mm -hmm. the um the gym and the, and the guys ran. Should we do it again? And 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 once we can meet in person again, obviously, if we're ever allowed to in the future. Uh, and would it move the hobby forward if we did? Do you think? I think yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I hope we, you know, that we've also been a couple of online cons now. I think it would be great to do those in person. Um, I think probably more challenging the geographical uh 
sort of spread of people these days in the, in the scene. I guess back then it was, you know, South London and, and um, you know, kind of the, the, the home counties, so a bit easier. But yeah, I mean, I think if, if it's logistically possible, I think it'd be great to get everyone in a room and, you know, or wherever and talk about design and new ideas and what we can throw around. Because it tends to happen in the pub after a game. But, you know, that's not always necessarily the most concrete place <laughs> for game development. So, yeah, be good. Yeah, fair enough. And you mentioned, I don't know if it was called The Last War, the two-day mega game on the boat on the Thames. Um, would you run, because obviously you run Horizon Mega Games, so you run a lot of Mega Games in normal times um, in, 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 in physical space. Would you run a two-day game? I run a two-day game. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sensing much, uh, much enthusiasm there, Alex. Um, no, I mean, I, I really like the idea and I'd like to play in a two-day game. The thought of, of running one and then doing it all again the next day is, is mildly terrifying. But um, <laughs> I think if, if we can properly prepare for it and, you know, not sit the Friday and the Monday off of work. Um, yeah, I, I think if the design needed it and it works, I think it, it's a definite experiment I'd really like to see again, yeah. Definitely. Would it be a normal size sort of mega game or would you go up to like 200 or 300 players? <laughs> no, I think keep it hundred ish. You know? no, fair enough. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think what does it? What does the design need? What 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 works? I think to be honest, with you. yeah. Well, what does the yeah? If the, if the design is for three hundred people over two days and it's been an amazing game, then great. Let's go for it. All right, fair enough. Uh, and how much do you take inspiration from the historic mega games when you're designing the mechanics for your own games? Um, say versus the, the genres and RPGs and video and board games that are out there. Um, I make games. Yeah, how much do you take from from the from the historic versus the modern? And that's from Alex Casper. Interesting. Um, I think I'd say the actual historic games. I, I mean, now I've talked to, to Jim and other people about the games. We, you know, I don't play them. I, I don't know them well enough to be huge super inspired by the mechanics at the time. But I, I do imagine all those their experience, their design ideas have filtered through to, to the modern games that that those guys put on. Um, so yeah, definitely, I take inspiration from other mega games uh, that I've played or, or controlled at. Um, though, I, you know. I've, I've, Probably talked about it before, but um, a lot of my designs do come from pop culture. Um, whatever the theme is, t- tends to sort of take a lot of ideas from whatever that that idea is. Those that bit of pop culture and similar games. So for my cyberpunk game, I stole a bunch of inspiration from like the Netrunner card game and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm completely shameless. I just steal from everywhere in my designs. So, yeah. No, no, I think that's a good idea. Honestly, <laughs> uh, back to the online sort of the other so the in-person conference for a second. Uh, Mr. Meg Game is asking. If there was a second great game, mega game conference, what would you hope to get out of it? Wow. Um, a few beers, you know. Um, <laughs> you yeah, know, I, th- I think I, I think what, I've, what, what we've learned actually over the pandemic is and, and different groups um, having a chance to, to mix is, well, I think the UK scene is, uh, yeah, it's obviously pretty small enough. We tend to all mix, share ideas, you know, the, the same games tend to, to get similar people. So we kind of uh, cross pollinate ideas. Probably that isn't so true with the US games or some of the European games or Australia or whatever. So I think if there was a way to do a conference and get everyone together to share those design ideas, I think that would be that probably be the, the best thing that could really be gained from it is sort of getting ideas and themes and uh sort of uh, sharing ideas with other groups around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah I think one of the great things about the pandemic actually has been the online games where we've kind of interacted more between the British and the Americans and other people around the world. Um, it's been it's been really good cross pollination of ideas definitely, um, and I think one final question here from from Alex Casper again: um, Are Meg games significant, significant enough to have their own canon, or do we always need to work with other sort of media formats and other games that are out there that to sort of steal their ideas? It's an interesting question. I think you could just play Mega Games and just be inspired by Mega Games. No, I don't think that that's wrong in any way but um i would also as a designer not want to limit myself in in that way i I love all forms of games you know it's like video games role playing games board games mega games uh and i think experiencing all these different sorts of gaming um as a designer or as even just a player gives you a better understanding of mechanics of how things work um uh, and and how you can kind of share those ideas um across the, the different types. So um, I, I, I don't know if we, you know, I think Mega Games can have its own canon. I think I've hopefully shown tonight, it's got a really strong and rich history. And I think you've got that, but I'd also say a designer probably shouldn't limit themselves to just Mega Games. So I think there's lots to be learned from elsewhere as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a really fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, once we get back into the real world and get out of lockdown, um, are you planning to run any Mega Games as part of Horizon Mega Games? 
Yes, yeah, definitely. We've uh, we've has a few sort of on the calendar that have been uh, put on pause for a year now. So uh, there was that Mirror Shades rerun. Uh, Jim's doing a, a reskin to watch the skies with a sort of Victorian um, theme. I always forget which year it is, Jim. I'm sorry. I think it's 1889. 1898, I think. Not 98, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll get that eventually. Um, thank you, Jim. 1898. Um, so yeah, uh, and also. Um, Ben Hirsch's uh, Starships and Six Shooters, the kind of Western sci-fi game. So they'll all be first off the blocks. I haven't yet got to rebooking dates just because we wait and see how things go with vaccines and the actual rollback plan, but it's only getting close to starting to look at that in the next couple of weeks if things continue to look positive. So. Yeah, it's hard to say right now, isn't it, whether or yeah, not we're actually yeah. going to get out of this lockdown <laughs> or in the times <laughs> that the government say we're going to. Definitely. Do you think, um, have you already, are these ones that were sort of booked before the pandemic started, are they full already or do you think they'll go? Um, they, they were all had, yeah, pretty much full sign ups, whether obviously everyone's still be available and new dates mm. and stuff, I don't know. So I imagine there were some spaces, but yeah, they, 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 a lot of them were booked up. So. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, nice. I look forward to when you've done some more research and can come back and uh, maybe write a book or do another presentation. <laughs> really we'll, fun. We'll yeah, I think uh, someone was suggesting we, we could meet in the pub channel because uh, Jim was saying he's got lots to say about Moor Park and stuff. So I, I'm going to go there because I'm going to hear yeah, absolutely. Anybody, to that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, um, yeah, absolutely. If anybody wants to meet in the pub channel in the Megacon Discord server, please head on over there and um, you can quiz Alex. We can have a chat. Um, if anybody wants to jump into the, one of the audio channels, um, we, can, we can do that and uh, continue the conversation there and rather than me asking all the questions everybody else can uh, can do so as well so but thank you very much Alex. actually there can talk about it as well yeah well, that's right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> rather than us talking on their behalf Indeed, yeah. cool no <laughs> yeah. thank you i hope you've enjoyed it yeah thank you alex thank you everyone very Cheers. good see you later